Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. This is our fortnightly catch up with the wonderful, the glorious, the always unpredictable Tony Lacantro from Alto Capital, all the way over there in the West, in the beautiful Perth, where they're allowed to go out for a drink and they can even go watch the footy. How are you, Tony? Uh, I'm going extremely well. And I think unpredictable is a good word to describe me <laughs> because you never know what's going to come out of my mouth. But you know, I've learned I've learned that honesty sets you free, and it's the only way to, to live your life, uh, rather than trying to please everyone. So, you know, let's just tell it how it is. Uh, I enjoy these chats. I'm getting great feedback from our chats as well. Oh, good. So, uh, yeah. But well, I, had, I, I actually had someone say to me, "So, do you script it beforehand? Do you do you have a whole thing?" That you, I'm like. We have no idea what we're going to talk about, do we, Tony? We just go, hey, how are you doing? It's the fortnightly catch-up. What's going on in the market? What's going out on in the big, bad world at the moment? Well, I think because the industry is so fluid and things change. Yeah. Uh, people's, people that trade through discount brokers can change their mind 20 times a day and um, hopefully not get stuck in an ASX meltdown. Uh, I wonder you how many that's people... coming? Oh, no, this was the, the system stuffing up yesterday. Oh yeah, the so I'm referring to all those poor people that might that were day trading that can't afford to pay for their shares, and I hope that they get some sort of settlement sorted out. Uh, that that's pretty nasty, and um, yeah, to see the whole market go down. A couple of weeks ago, we had the TAB go down as well, and then Coles checkouts as well. So there are some computer glitches. What's going to happen? You know, points to ponder here, Tony. What's going to happen when we go? fully digital there's no cash everything's digital everything's online and then like the asx yesterday something happens what do we do we go to the go to the uh, go to woolies to or coles and buy a loaf of bread and they go no system's down starve it's yeah no it's so yeah we're certainly reliant on um technology and we saw that you know with the boeing 737 maxes where these things too computerized no pilot control and the bloody thing crashes so um, yeah, society is going to it's getting all digitized, and you know we don't carry cash. But um, does that concern? Anyway, the world? Well, we're going slightly off topic here, but I'm just interested yeah. in your view. Does does going um, fully digital and no cash does that concern you at all? I personally don't like it at all. But I guess I guess we have to um, adapt adapt to society, and uh, it's it's just the way of the future, the way the world's going, and we've had. This has been one heck of a year, uh, but I can assure viewers that this interview chats totally, we, we wing every one of them. So um, bring it on. <laughs> All right. Well, let's yeah. bring it on. Uh, this week, Azure Minerals had a, well, it's actually probably the past few weeks, Azure Minerals been on a bit of a tear with their Andover Nickel project. Let's talk all things nickel for a few minutes. Um, is the nickel price strong? There's a lot of talk about nickel. I mean, obviously, I'm a gold nerd. I want to get onto gold as well. But what are you thinking about nickel? And are there any special ones that you like out there at the moment? Have you got any, you know, is your well, eye on any specific ones at the moment? Yeah, I am, I am having a look around. Uh, let's briefly discuss Azua. I mean, the stock was six cents during the COVID crunch. And they have this Andover project, which is 60% Azua, 40% Creasy. And that thing's now capped at $200 million. So it's just come off 92 cents, but that can show you that a stock can go from six cents to almost a dollar. And now they're talking, everyone's starting to talk it up, but the risk is now, well, how much is that project worth? And is it gonna be a mineable resource? Well, just for those listeners out there, I have today done an interview with the lovely Tony Rivera, who's the managing director. I've known Tony for a very long time. Tony Rivera, that is from Azure. He, he's the most excited I've seen him in a long time. And, you know, he was a co-discoverer on the Cosmos discovery. And he reckons this is, this is something to keep an eye on. And, you know, he doesn't over, over egg the, uh, the projects anytime. I don't think. Oh, He's no, well, cool. there's a picture of Tony next to persistence in the dictionary to steal a line from steal a line from Wall Street. But yeah, no, he was around in the Nickel Australia days, early uh, the involvement in um, other nickel deposits. So good 
good luck to him. You just persist. And, you know, the silver story in Mexico has kind of been dwarfed by what they found at Andover. And, yeah. you know, you just look at what Chalice did and you can see what once you're onto a discovery, it doesn't matter what commodity it is, the market will reward you. And that's through the gold, uh, other base metals, copper, zinc. Actually, the market just couldn't give a toss about zinc at the moment. Uh, why, is that? why is that, Tony? I just don't think it, you know, it doesn't reward the big intersections. I don't know. I don't know what zinc companies have to do. I mean, I'm involved in a little one called Alter Zinc that puts out consistently good results and it can't even get through half a cent and, and it's still cheap. I, I just don't think that these zinc hits excite anyone. I think, you know, we've seen what Sirius did at Nova, uh, Independence Group, some other nickel explorers. We can see what they can do. So the market is more focused on a decent copper hit, a decent nickel hit, and a decent gold hit. But, you know, the Australian nickel sector pretty much was formed by the majors selling out, and that was a Kambauda bubble um, in the early 2000s. Yeah. Well, I think also you've got to look at the fact that people like Elon Musk come back, come out and say, I need as much nickel as I can get because we are going to be creating a lot of EVs in the future. Which is another another promising aspect. And I see the price is up around 16000 uh, US. Uh, I was involved in the last uh, nickel bubble where it went, I think it went to $52,000 a tonne wow. Australian. And uh, we had stocks like Independence Group, well over $10. Western areas, well over $10 as well. But, I mean, this, this uh, Andover project that Azua have is certainly generating some interest in the nickel sector. And it just goes to show if you persist and drill into hopefully an ore body, yeah, you get rewarded. Yeah, he's, he was saying today they've done four drill holes and they've intersected massive nickel sulphide in all four, which is unusual. Yeah, so uh, we'll wait for the assays. That that stock will um, it'll ebb and flow. Uh, you know, we've seen obviously we've seen what Chris Cantor Stavely did with their copper discovery in Victoria um, from in the teens to a dollar forty two and back to twenty seven cents during COVID. They're now around ninety, but speculators have to be mindful that you need to sell some at the height of the exploration phase. That's really good advice because I think we spoke about this last time, the psychology of investing. And it's really interesting you bring that up because when the gold price was, you know, heading towards the 2000, everybody was getting really excited about it. Stock prices were going up. Now, the gold price had a bit of a pullback. I, I say to people, it's like a department store sale. You just turn around and go, perfect. It's a great buying opportunity. But a lot of people get fearful at that time. And I find it quite amusing that, you know, they don't look at the bigger picture. They kind of look at the immediacy. Well, I mean, I've been advising retail clients for 22 years and I've actually had to start really lecturing them. I said to one who's he's probably in my top five clients, I said, you cannot change your behaviour. Your psychology has not changed and I'm trying to get you to be more aggressive with your selling. I mean... You know, we've had, we had one stock, Dampier Gold, which went 2.2 .2 to 12, 12 cents. And I'm saying you have to sell at that peak to reduce some anxiety and put that capital to better use. Right. But once, once you don't sell at the top and then you see the previous high is your ceiling or where you're going to sell some and that capital is put to sleep. So I just say to my clients, look, you need to listen if I say sell, nine times out of 10, I'm right. But look, to be honest, from my experience, there's very few people have, that have any idea what the hell they're doing with these stocks. I agree. Um, you'll see gold stocks get pummeled. Uh, the best growth stocks, you know, you see a couple of people start to sell a stock and it's an avalanche. And I know there's a lot of technical trading that will exit these stocks and the selling is just brutal. So you, we have to accept that the chi -X traders, the PIP traders are going to come in and our stocks will overshoot. But my goodness, you have to smack that buying when you got the chance. 
Is that, uh, do you find that that's a really difficult one to, to drill into people? Is it, is it, is it constantly batting your head, bashing your head against the brick wall, trying to get them to sell? Or do you have some clients that go, I get it, Tony. And should that always be the case? Should you always look at it? And if it has a very strong run, say, listen, take the profit off the table. We can always come back in. Or, you know, what's, how does that work? And is it always the same? Oh, I, think, I think every client's different. But this, oh, buy back in garbage rarely happens. I think that's, that's just an excuse. Uh, you know, I, it's, just, it's just fascinating that I can't, I ring up a client and say, look, you've, you've won a share of Saturday Lotto here, which is anywhere from 200 to half a million dollars, and they will not take the profit. Yeah. Um, and that, I said, well, what the hell are you doing? I, I think what it's all about effective use of capital. Everyone thinks that, this stock is going to be the next Northern star and go 300 times, but they don't. You need to work out which stock is a Usain Bolt or which stock's going to run like a Kenyan. So that's part of my job is to work out what we do with the shares. But if you make 500%, take some profit and never mistake a bull market for brains as well. And there's another index which I've created myself. It's called the Broken English Index. So I go onto forums, I won't mention any names, and there's a lot of people now that are into the spec market but cannot string a sentence together. And when you see that level peaking, you know uh, we're in for a bit of a short-term spanking. Oh, goodness. So I, I just think you get a lot of people come in. We've now got apps where you can pay $5 brokerage, you can buy $100 worth of a stock. It's like these products selling parts of a house like bricks where you can buy. I mean, it's just absolute BS that people become enthralled with the thrill of making money. But I'll tell you what, not many people know how to do it. That's really interesting. And there's a, you know, we're in Australia. We're a punting nation, aren't we? Uh, but they, they, most of them don't know how to punt very well. Well, we're the, uh, the biggest gamblers per capita on, on the planet. Are we? We are. Yeah, the average Australian, I think, loses $1,200. I'm actually uh, been watching the SBS documentary called Addicted. Right. So, and it's it's funny how I'm actually addicted to finding small cap value situations. And that addiction flows through um, to my five-year supply of deodorant I've got in my cupboard. I'm always <laughs> buying things at a fraction of fair value but it's a healthy addiction to have. But, but I know, I can tell um, from advising the dot-com bubble, very few clients were able to turn around their punting habits. And it's all about, you know, they say that buying and selling shares gives you the same type of thrill as cocaine does. And that's all it is. It's an addiction. Right. And a lot of people are going to blow up. And as I said before, once you see that broken English index get to where it is now, it just shows the market's probably at a short-term top and it needs to have a rest. That's interesting. Do you think that, because uh, there's a lot of people saying that the market is a little bit overblown at the moment. Uh, where do you see it? Well, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong in the short term. Uh, so what COVID's done... Wait, hang on a second, Tony. Can you just say that again? I'm happy to be... He said, Did you say you're happy to be wrong? <laughs> well, I'm happy to be wrong in the short term because what's happened is a global pandemic has kind of uh, led to the stimulus, which means that house prices are going to stay inflated yes. for longer. Uh, retail spending is up. People are going out to buy stuff they don't need to impress people they hate anyway. Yep. Um, uh, look, at, look at what Afterpay is doing. Uh, all the late fees. I mean, that stock was that $8. Stock, I reckon that stock is ready for a bit of a blow-off. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you look at you look at it. I mean, I used to go into Tarakash and try on shirts, and there'd be an afterpay sticker. And this is in the early days. I just I just can't see it. I just can't see this rampant consumerism. Obviously, they're going to clamp down, and you know, obviously on the payday lenders. But I just think the world has gone a little bit crazy, like it did in two thousand and seven, eight. So, yeah, the Dow Jones, obviously Biden, a uh, couple of vaccines showing promise. 
but markets have done well on knowing bad news. And I think what's going to shock a lot of people is the market is actually going to fall on good news. I just think it's priced for absolute perfection. And so, I mean, I'm, I suggest my clients buy ETFs. They're down. And they'll, one client actually complained about it. And I said, well, you've made fifty, dollars $100,000 at the other end. You can't have both. Exactly. So... I just think markets are totally irrational. And once this COVID haze fades, we're left with a weak economy, a very weak economy. Yeah. Uh, a lot of jobs are going to go. Yeah, it's interesting. Today, uh, the, the uh, New South Wales uh, government came out and said $100 for every, I think it's I think it's every man, woman and child, maybe it's for everybody mm. over 18. You're going you're gonna to get four vouchers of $25 each to go and spend at restaurants or uh, play uh, theatres, et cetera, to stimulate the economy. So it's more, you know, we're just handing out the funny money left, right and centre. But a lot of this funny money, uh, I mean, these vouchers are uh, ring fenced to be spent in a certain way, but a lot of these stimulus checks have been punted on the share market, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess what's, what you remember those entertainment books? Isn't yes, very about- much. And now it's online. I mean, to me, to me, this is like handing my kids copious amounts of money. They're not going to learn. It's not going to make them happy. Uh, we are, the spending is absolutely ridiculous. Retail, retail figures were abysmal. We're still going to see a lot of retailers go under. Uh, not it's not just, the Amazons and the onlines. They're all doing very well. Thank you very much. Exactly right. But anyone, you know, if you're artistic and create clothes that you only wear once, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Um, but the spending, I just think it's, we're in a fog and it's ridiculous and confidence at the moment's breeding confidence. But I mean, once, once the handouts stop, people, you know, a quarter of the people on mortgage holidays are worried that they can't start to repay the loan next year. And there's 800,000 mortgages and small enterprise loans that are that are paused. So, geez, it's not it's not going to be pretty, Kerry. Yeah, but for the moment, the party keeps going on. It's like, what did they do in you know when you were a kid? What was it? Musical chairs would we'll just keep running around until the chair gets pulled away. Well, yeah, well that well that's it. And um, yeah, those, those days the the days of the party, but. Look, it's like Australians have binged. You've gone out and bought a KFC family feast and then suddenly someone offers you a Zinger burger. You just can't handle the... <laughs> you just can't binge on that amount of absolute junk and that's what Australians are doing. And, you know, good luck with a curbside cleanup in two years. I mean, the curbs are going to be littered with uh, treadmills, printers and junk we don't need. So I think this is an extremely dangerous time in Australia perfect time to sell your used car that market's tightened right up time to sell your overpriced house to the next victim and time to sell any rubbish you don't need and because i think what's going to happen is we're going back to a basics economy back to where you know the good old 70s but now uh yeah it's just ridiculous and what it's done has created a lot more traders now a lot more traders, our markets become dangerous. There's no interest in the bank for for pensioners that need it. So extremely dangerous times. And gamblers generally, you know, there's no bigger oxymoron than a good poker machine player. Well, you just mentioned banks. Yeah. You don't like the banks, do you? I'm looking now because we do this every fortnight. What, you know, if you were, for those that are listening, how would you protect, or let's start again, how would you grow and protect your wealth in these really uncertain times? What would your advice be? I Look, there's been no greater destruction of wealth than the hunt for yield, but people are stuck on that yield theme. So you'd have to look outside the financials to get some income. Uh, I mean, Telstra is looking at reinvigorating itself, uh, you've got gambling stocks, which I know people won't buy for ethical reasons. You're going to have to start looking at small industrials. Uh, but the banks obviously have recovered well since uh, since the COVID smackdown. But, you know, you're going to look at these uh, interest rates outside the banks, which, you know, like Mayfair and all these other schemes, scams, 
are just going to cost people. This is going to cost people money because they they read an advertisement in the paper offering eight to ten percent per annum guarantee. And I mean, wasn't Bernie Madoff eleven percent per annum guarantee? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And and I just I look at it as you know people are fearful, stupid, and and greedy. And you know you look at these cults and people that believe absolute rubbish. Uh, I tell you what, there's going to be lots of scams, lots of lotteries, lots of underground bad behaviour um, because inherently we're stupid. Okay, well let's let's say that we're not that stupid. Would you okay. would you would you suggest that your clients keep any money in the banks at the moment, the big four? Oh hell no. Steer clear. Yeah, I'll steer clear. I mean, and what if, what if what if they've they've uh, like uh, historically they've had say. I don't know, 30% of their portfolio is the banks because it used to give the, you know, they're, they're heading into retirement. That used to give them a good uh, dividend payment, which has been slashed, as we know. Uh, would you tell them to get out now or just stick with a very small dividend every now and again? Well, I think, you know, baby boomers, let's be honest, have <laughs> created huge amounts of wealth from sitting on their backsides. Yeah. Um, they've watched their house prices go. They've had the financial run up. The smart baby boomers that switched to gold stocks in 2014, 2015 have been handsomely rewarded. But what I say to my clients is I stick to finding small companies that become bigger ones. That's going to be an ongoing theme. And why would I risk my reputation with blue chips, which is pretty much red or black? You're always prone to earnings warnings. You're prone to debt. You're prone to all these risk factors. Yeah. Um, so I just stick to what I know. It's like, you know, you you uh, put on the latest ACDC album. It's they don't change their they don't change their tune. They're coming so, back, Tony. ACDC, Akadaka are back. Yeah. But that's that's classic. They've stuck to what they know. They haven't gone out and written love songs. They haven't tried to be anything else, and they've been hugely successful. So. I mean, I always look at the top 150 companies to find value, and I can't. I cannot find any value. And I'm thinking, well, I can find a $0.05 cent stock that potentially could get to $0.20 cents and beyond. Why would I risk my reputation on, on a so-called blue chip? So I just stick to my guns. I only take a portion of my client's wealth and use that for high risk. But um, I think what I've found is through every correction since I've been involved in 1998, good small companies always become much bigger ones unless they get taken over beforehand. Okay, so I'm going to ask you again. Do you reckon that uh, we're in for a bit of a pullback in the near future? It's inevitable. Right. And I, I think there's no bigger... I liken this to a person's threshold for pain relates to the Dow Jones. Any falls above a thousand points, which would be about three percent, that causes mass fear. Anything north of five hundred, yeah, it scares the crap out of people. Two, three hundred, no. But we are due for some pretty nasty nights to the downside, and we'll we'll start to see two, three, four percent down days on our market because markets are overpriced. We're in a haze of COVID. And there's so much stimulus going on in the world that markets will eventually revert to reasonable value and eventually overshoot to the downside. So I think anyone speculating now uh, is certainly in for dangerous times, but I just stick to what I know. And eventually good companies become bigger ones and watch the ASX technical glitches because that's that cost a lot of people a lot of money yesterday. All righty. Well, uh, the gold price had a bit of a pullback. Do you want to mention gold at all at the moment? Or we're running out of time, but uh, any comments? Oh, yeah, I, know, I know we end up talking for far too long sometimes. Look, um, I love the gold sector. There's always great growth stories. Uh, I've got my favourite gold companies. People can do a bit of search on social media. And the other thing they should be doing is to listen to some growth stories is your virtual conference on the 26th of November. I think that's- Oh, thank you, Tony. Say, and, that again. Uh, Say that again, what's happening on the 26th of November? You have a virtual gold conference and probably one of the smartest small cap investors on the planet, Rick Rule, uh, is there along with Jim Rickard. So I've got enormous respect for Rick 
And I think anyone that's in speculation, doesn't matter what commodity or sector, should spend the time to listen to Rick Rule and uh, can't wait to hear his talk. Yeah, it's, it's good. We've got Jim Rickards is going to open the conference and Rick Rule's going to close it. I've also got Rob Murdoch, who uh, runs the Oztex Resource Opportunities, which is a great subscription service. He's going to do a, an overall view of, uh, of what's happened in the gold sector in the last 12 months. And of course, Richard Morrow from uh, Bailey's. And we've got, uh, I've got, uh, who have I got? Bronson Checky from ABC Bullion. And ABC Bullion, by the way, couldn't do it without them. They're sponsoring. They're, they're yeah. supporting the event, which is awesome. Yeah, and I think um, the other talks that are well worthwhile is Jordan Alessio. Oh, Jordan is brilliant. Yep. Yeah, Jordan Alessio, Perth Mint, big supporters as well. So, yeah, it's going to be a really good day. So since you've brought it up, I might as well just say, if people want to go and register, it's free, ladies and gentlemen. It's free. Yeah. Uh, gold events, G-O-L-D-E-V-E-N-T-S, goldevents.com.au. And I will ask small caps to pop the link below. And I will ask them also to pop the link. Hopefully they'll do it uh, for your Twitter handle because you're quite you're quite uh, active on Twitter, aren't you, Tony? Yeah, I probably put out far too much information. So <laughs> anyway, no one believes me, so I'll keep doing it. I believe you every fortnight, Tony. Every fortnight I have a chat and I always believe you. So as always, fantastic yep. to have a chat today. We'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks for chatting with Small Caps. Look forward to it, Kerry. Thank you.